Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this organic chemistry video deals with factors affecting the SN2 mechanism, nucleophile strength. The SN2 reaction is affected by a number of different factors. In a previous video, I discussed substitution of the alkyl halide, whether it's methyl primary, secondary, or tertiary. Another video covered leaving group ability. This particular video is going to focus on nucleophile strength. How good of a nucleophile is this? How able is it to come in and attack that carbon and make a bond? In a subsequent video, we'll discuss reaction solvent. The nucleophile has a profound effect on the SN2 reaction rate. It attacks in the rate determining step, the rate limiting step. There's only one step in the SN2 reaction and it involves the nucleophile. Therefore, the nucleophile affects SN2 rate. A stronger nucleophile gives a faster SN2 reaction and strong nucleophiles are good at attacking electrophilic carbon. So what defines a nucleophile is its ability to come in and make a bond to that carbon, for example. Nucleophilicity and basicity are related concepts, but they aren't the same. And so subsequent slides, we're going to try to explain what the similarities and differences are. This slide talks about nucleophilicity and basicity and compares them. Bases attack protons, nucleophiles attack other electron poor atoms like carbon. Here's an example of a alkyl halide reacting with a nucleophile. So in this reaction, the nucleophile is going to attack the carbon and the leaving group leaves. This is a substitution reaction and it's the focus of chapter 7. The result is a substitution product the leaving group has left. Bases react with protons. Here's an example of a base reacting with an alkyl halide. The base can pull off the proton next to the leaving group that gives a new carbon-carbon double bond and an alkene. That's called an elimination reaction and that's going to be the subject of chapter 8. One thing that can get a little bit complicated is that some molecules can act as both nucleophiles and bases. As an example of this, hydroxide can do this. Here OH- acts as a nucleophile, attacks the carbon and displaces halogen and that gives an alcohol substitution product. But Hydroxide can also act as a base, so it could deprotonate the proton here. Those electrons could go to make a carbon-carbon double bond and the leaving group leave. That would give water as a coproduct. This slide will help you start to compare strengths of nucleophiles. Here's an example that compares the strength of hydroxide nucleophile to acetate nucleophile. What you want to do is locate the nucleophilic atom in each case, which is the most electron-rich atom in each molecule. And in hydroxide, it's the O-, and in acetate, it's again the O-. In this case, it's pretty easy. Some molecules, it's a little bit more challenging, but generally what you want to look for is the most electron-rich atom. Sometimes it has a negative charge, but not always. The first trend we're going to look at is this one. So for nucleophiles that have the same nucleophilic atom, the stronger base is also the stronger nucleophile. In this case, hydroxide has an isolated minus charge. There's no way that that oxygen can share the minus charge with any other atom. However, with acetate, the charge is delocalized by resonance. So this shows how a resonance structure can delocalize the charge onto another oxygen. That increases the stability of the acetate minus significantly. The hydroxide negative charge is a less stable anion, therefore it's a stronger base, and that also makes it then a stronger nucleophile. With acetate, that's a more stable anion because it's more delocalized. It's a weaker base, and therefore that's a weaker nucleophile. So this is a trend that can be helpful. Here's another example of that first trend. This example looks at ethoxide versus trifluoroethoxide. In this example, the fluorine atoms inductively withdraw electron density, which stabilizes this anion over here on the right. Here's how that looks. Each of the fluorines withdraws some electron density from the carbon that they're attached to. That tends to make this carbon partially positive. It, in turn, pulls electron density away from the carbon that it is attached to. That tends to make this carbon partially positive. And then that carbon in turn pulls electron density away from the negatively charged oxygen. So in effect, the negatively charged oxygen has some of its electron density shared through these bonds with fluorine atoms. That makes this oxygen less electron rich and therefore it's going to be a more stable anion, a weaker base, and a weaker nucleophile as a result. Whereas ethoxide is a less stable anion, it's a stronger base, and it's a stronger nucleophile. Here's another example with carbon nucleophiles. In this example, we've got a carbon nucleophile here and a carbon nucleophile here. 
The important characteristic here is the amount of s character on each one of these atoms. So the more s orbital character that an atom has, that places electron density closer to the nucleus, which is more stable. So in the left example, this carbon is sp3 hybridized, so it has sp3 hybrid orbitals, and its lone pair is in an sp3 orbital. Whereas over here, in the right example, this carbon is sp hybridized, and its electrons are placed in an sp hybridized orbital. The sp orbital has a lot more s character. It's one half s, whereas the sp3 orbital is only one quarter s. And you can tell that based on the shapes too. The sp3, the way it's drawn here, is much more elongated, much more p-like, whereas the sp orbital is a lot more spherical because it's got a lot more s character. So that makes this particular anion on the right a more stable anion because it has its electrons closer to the nucleus. That makes it a weaker base and a weaker nucleophile. Compare that to the anion on the left, which is a less stable anion. It's a stronger base and a stronger nucleophile. Here's another trend in nucleophile strengths. We're going to take a look at OH- versus H2O in this example. Trend 2 states that a negatively charged nucleophile is stronger than its conjugate acid. Here's a negatively charged nucleophile. And over here is its conjugate acid. The only difference here is the species on the right has picked up a proton. This is a much more electron rich nucleophile on the left and it's a much stronger nucleophile as a result. The oxygen here is a lot less electron rich, therefore this is a weaker nucleophile. This is really just a special case of trend one that says that for nucleophiles with the same nucleophilic atom, the stronger base is also the stronger nucleophile. So this is a stronger base than this. And in this case, you can see the nucleophilic atom in both cases is an oxygen. A third trend in nucleophile strengths is related to electronegativity. And it states that nucleophilicity increases from right to left within the same row of the periodic table due to electronegativity. And this matches with basicity trends. Here's a little snippet of the upper right hand portion of the periodic table. The trend states that as nucleophiles go from right to left across the periodic table, they increase in strength. A fluoride nucleophile would be weaker than an oxygen nucleophile, which would be weaker than a nitrogen nucleophile, which would be weaker than a carbon nucleophile. Here are some examples to illustrate this trend. Here's a snippet of the periodic table and a few examples of nucleophiles from one of the top rows. You can see there's a carbon nucleophile here on the left, followed by a nitrogen nucleophile, an oxygen nucleophile, and a fluorine nucleophile. And as with the periodic table, the trends are in this direction, where the fluorine nucleophile is the weakest, and the carbon nucleophile is the strongest. And the reason for this is due to electronegativity differences. Fluorine is a more electronegative element, for example, than oxygen. Fluorine holds onto its electrons more tightly than oxygen, and it's less likely to share electrons. Fluorine is also more stable as an anion, so fluoride is more stable than oxygen negative, which is more stable than a nitrogen anion, which is more stable than a carbon anion. And therefore, electronegativity dictates the strength of the nucleophiles and the strength of the basicity of these atoms. Here are a couple more examples, sulfur nucleophile versus chlorine nucleophile. And again, based on the periodic trend, the sulfur nucleophile is a stronger nucleophile than the chlorine nucleophile, due to the position in the periodic table and the electronegativity differences. Here's another example with neutral nucleophiles. Again, the nitrogen nucleophile versus the oxygen nucleophile. The nitrogen nucleophile is stronger and the oxygen nucleophile is weaker. Now, one thing you'll notice here is that we have to compare species with similar charge states. So in this top example, all of these nucleophiles were charged. In this example here, these nucleophiles were charged. And in this example, the nucleophiles were neutral. It gets a lot more complicated if you try to compare a negatively charged oxygen nucleophile to a neutral nitrogen nucleophile, for example, then um, it's you can't really make comparisons based on purely periodic trends with those types of examples. The other thing you have to be careful of is when you're you're comparing nucleophiles at different rows in the periodic table. For example, you have to be very careful when you're trying to compare an oxygen nucleophile, for example, and a sulfur nucleophile, because going up or down the periodic table, the trends in nucleophilicity are solvent dependent, and we'll talk about those concepts in a little bit. A fourth trend to consider when trying to rank nucleophiles by strength is that steric bulk near the nucleophilic atom greatly reduces nucleophilicity. To put it in another way, Bulky molecules make poor nucleophiles, while thin molecules make good nucleophiles. Here's an example with two oxygen nucleophiles. 
Both of these molecules are quite strong bases and their nucleophilic atoms are oxygen. However, the one on the right is quite a bit bulkier than the one on the left. There's a lot of stuff around the O- here that can get in the way of this molecule approaching a carbon to attack it. So this molecule makes a rather poor nucleophile, while the one on the left, which is a lot less hindered, makes a much better nucleophile. Over here on the right, weaker nucleophile, bulkier. On the left, stronger nucleophile, it's much thinner. Here's an example with some nitrogen nucleophiles. In these cases, we have a nucleophilic atom, that's a nitrogen. In the example on the left, the nitrogen is a lot more open to approach carbons and make bonds with them because there are two carbon groups attached. In the molecule on the right, the nitrogen has three carbon groups and this increases its steric bulk near the nucleophilic atom. So this nitrogen in the molecule on the right is going to have a much more difficult time acting as a nucleophile. This molecule is a weaker nucleophile because it's a lot bulkier, while the one on the left is a stronger nucleophile because it's a lot less bulky.